Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, remote LA Drupal meetup for April 2020. Um, very interesting experiment, of course. So uh, first off, uh, I want to point out uh, and say thank you to Stoffer um, for being our uh, venue sponsor when we meet in person and through uh, this uh, stay in uh, place, uh, you know, period. Um, Stoffer is also our virtual venue host and sponsor. So thank you to Stoffer and uh, team for doing that. Yep. Good There's job. A, Yay, Stoffer. A person here that I don't know pretty damn well. Right. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, thank you, and um, we're going to call out a, a job announcements here, so um, if you guys can let us know if you're going to participate in that. But first things first, uh, outside of sponsors and our initial thank you is, uh, you know, Drupal community, we're in this together. Uh, um, you know, Drupal is growing, as always, in terms of uh, complexity, uh, integration, uh, expertise, um, and, and importance in the, uh, you know, open CMS uh, space. And uh, so, of course, you know, we're all staying safe right now. Um, the, uh, you know, the media things we have to announce always is uh, Drupal Association membership. Uh, as always, there are three tiers uh, for people that can give back to the Drupal community and the Drupal project that doesn't have to be code commits. Um, but, you know, basically through uh, a few dollars, you or your company uh, can help, um, you know, support Drupal and the community at large. And, you know, the funds here help uh, fund DrupalCon, the Drupal Association, all those uh, things. And especially right now, um, as I'll point out, there's some news uh, and impact to DrupalCon because of the uh, uh, stay in place, uh, shelter in place that's going on nationwide right now. Um, that, uh, you know, the association needs some additional help, but I'm going to make a mention about that in a sec, but uh, individuals for as low as 15 bucks can help uh, Drupal. Okay. Um, so uh, this is our agenda for the night. As usual, we will be doing some uh, quick open job announcements. Um, I have some basic Drupal news to go over and then we'll cover uh, our presentations. And then, um, especially since it's online, this will be interesting. Uh, we usually do the breakout groups in Social After Dark. Uh, so since uh, we're all doing this remotely, uh, it'll just be a virtual one, uh, Social After Dark, and we'll see where the conversation goes. Um, but yeah, we are recording this uh, FYI. For anybody who just joined or was curious, um, we will be posting the recording up onto our LA Drupal YouTube channel where we have uh, you know a, a decade of videos or more. All right. So uh, we have some job announcements uh, virtually uh, that we can uh, participate in right now. Who would like to unmute themselves and do a job announcement? And for the video, people watching the video later, uh, the job may or may not be available by the time you watch the video. Full disclosure. Not for me, but I was contacted by a recruiter last week for Sony, I believe. So if anyone wants, uh, I can get them in touch with the recruiter for that one that contacted me for that. They did, Ashok, uh, when I spoke to, I spoke to him as well. Uh, they were requiring it to be on site, just as an FYI. Uh, oh, and the company was CBS. That's what I was remembering. It was one of the studios, but it was CBS. Oh, you CBS? Yep. Oh, interesting. Uh, I think they. I think that that person hit like everybody up. <laughs> um, yeah, they literally did, and then didn't respond. What was the well. position? It's a technical architect. Oh, Stoffer, yeah. your lighting is good. I'm, I'm looking at everyone's video real quick. Your lighting is really good. That's because I actually planned for it before. Oh, you bought something. I, I, I have a business to run, my friends. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good light, whatever, oh, whatever one you bought. That's a good one. Right. He's put on blush. Like, so. <laughs> blush. No problem. Blush works. All right. Uh, any other job announcements that you suffer? I wish. And a stroke? No, you guys are talking about it. Any... No, nothing else from me. Okay. All right. Let's move on. 
Um, so for Drupal News, uh, as always, there's just a couple updates. And uh, since we didn't meet last month uh, because of the initial uh, uh, public health uh, uh, stuff going on, um, there's been some, uh, some updates. First, uh, DrupalCon, which was scheduled to happen in May next month, uh, is canceled. This should not be really a surprise to anybody right now. Um, and as a result, uh, there is, uh, to the second point here, uh, there's been an announcement that there will be some impact to kind of uh, the budget that the association was, uh, you know, kind of uh, expecting to carry forward because, um, you know, there's other DrupalCons to plan ahead for, you know, a lot of uh, deposits to make, stuff like that. And of course, uh, just budgets that the association uses to pay for monthly bills. Um, that, uh, you know, since there's gonna be a strain since DrupalCon will not be happening, um, that, you know, the, the association has to make it up another way. So one of the announcements on the second bullet here is Dries, uh, the founder, uh, creator of Drupal, has offered to match donations to the association and Drupal up to $100,000. So um, that should uh, definitely, you know, like even you saw earlier with the individual tier being at $15, uh, you know, uh, that can now be matched and will now infuse 30 full dollars, uh, which is, uh, you know, multiply that by, uh, you know, 100 people, 1,000 people. Uh, it starts to really add up and help take care of, uh, you know, um, the things that, you know, need to be taken care of there. So uh, pointing that out, uh, all the information is, of course, on Drupal.org. Uh, final bullet here. Drupal 9 beta 2 available now. Anyone, anyone install it yet? Just checking to see if anybody else tried it. No, nothing really to do, nothing major, right? Because uh, we'll be going over and uh, we have our update uh, about uh, Drupal 9 in just a few slides. But of course, uh, DrupalCon, because we know uh, what DrupalCon dates were for the next five years. Um, we, you know, refer back to the slide each meetup. Uh, we see, unfortunately, of course, Minneapolis 2020 for next month was canceled. Um, but we can see here that Boston 2021, um, everybody can start kind of thinking about uh, making their plans to Boston or if they would prefer the West Coast, uh, know that 2022. And I know that's a lot of time away, uh, but we know that obviously Drupal 9 is going to be the main project, uh, you know, discussed. Um, and because, of course, they're uh, interdependent, I mean, inter uh, uh, version uh, kind of um, compatibility between uh, all the uh, last bits of Drupal 8. So, modules that supported, you know, uh, Drupal 8, 6, 8, 7, 8, 8, 8, 9 uh, should be easily uh, adoptable for Drupal 9 for, uh, you know, very few lines of code changes. Um, so, <clears throat> all right, those are the Drupal candidates as always. Anybody, uh, anybody see, or anybody, you know, um, was planning to go to DrupalCon Minneapolis? I know I was, my whole team was. I think Stoffer, he was kind of, you know. Well, I'm sure a bunch of us uh, now just, uh, you know, have to reroute our uh, networking, catching up for Drupal, you know, staying up to date. So uh, definitely, uh, you know, stay with, LA Drupal and, uh, you know, we'll keep you guys up to date as we can. Aren't they going to try and do anything virtual or anything at all just for, for that kind of stuff? Or is it just completely gone? So, you know, I wouldn't be surprised that, you know, some, some bits from the community, uh, people start filling in the gaps, you know, um, we'll, we'll see that happen. It's an organic thing that the Drupal community has been doing for the last 15 plus years. Uh, Drupal hit 19, uh, you know, recently, but, uh, I, I know from my experience, uh, you know, um, again, the community fills in the gaps somewhere. Uh, all right. Uh, Drupal 9, this is an easy one. We've been doing this each meetup uh, ever since uh, we knew the countdown for Drupal 9. Uh, and uh, just a very ugly, large, uh, <laughs> enlarged uh, photo here. Uh, but it just shows the adoption of uh, most recently of the stats of sites running on these Drupal versions. And we see, obviously, Drupal 7 is just still killing it. Um, and, uh, you know, 9 is on the on the map now. So there's a couple little uh, 9 previews, people pushing some beta sites up. Obviously, since 9 is really just uh, the last versions of 8 uh, with, uh, all, you know, some of the items in the cruft, uh, old stuff, uh, you know, um, the uh, deprecated stuff booted out. Um, you know, if, if your site is simple enough right now and doesn't have too crazy of uh, some other dependencies, uh, you can probably just click right up to nine and just keep coasting from there. But we see uh, from this map that 
Uh, here's the dates, obviously, uh, you know, we have 8.8 .8 and uh, we're waiting for this summer, Drupal 8.9 to come out, which will be the last version of Drupal 8 major. Uh, and basically people will have uh, essentially one full calendar year, uh, one and a half, almost, uh, almost one and a half years uh, before uh, Drupal 8 is decommissioned along with Drupal 7. Uh, and this is due to Symphony, uh, not, nothing on Drupal's part. Uh, but Symphony being deprecated, the version three, uh, that was a minimum requirement being pushed up. Um, this is uh, the motivation for uh, nine adopting essentially, uh, you know, a continued branch from uh, the Drupal eight work. Quick question um, so, there. Did, did you, do you know if, if they decided on Symphony five or Symphony four for, for nine X's? Uh, there was a thread that I read about that. That was, uh, we mentioned that we talked about it one of the last yeah, a while ago. Yeah. It was like yeah. a couple months ago. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't remember, know if you remember. heard anything ch changed on that. Uh, I did not find a note change myself, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a conversation or something, you know, yeah. I, other things have taken precedence and, uh, that detail kind of got lost, but, um, you know, it makes sense because of the, uh, new release of, uh, uh, beta 2, and by the way, we are only 50 days away from Drupal's release. That is 5-0, everybody. We are in double digits, okay? Nice. This is going to start ticking down very fast. And, um, oh, where is this? Uh, yeah, I thought I had another slide there real quick, but, um, you know, the D9 stuff that we've got, uh, yeah, people, beta 2 is out. Uh, that was the other big announcement. I, I think maybe I had it on the earlier slide. Uh, yeah, I had it on the beginning um you know so now we're going to start seeing people just mentally start looking for drupal 9 material drupal 9 training uh our our providers and vendors all drupal 9 ready um and you know through that uh we've seen that there's modules like uh the uh um, drupal reactor or update reactor um the update status module these are all drupal 8 modules that you grab and will help you guys move up to drupal 9 very easily all right I'm done with my parts. Um, any last questions or comments about Drupal 9 that you guys want to throw in? Um, we're going to jump into our talks. Yeah, I just uh, saw that there's an issue for making Drupal 9 compatible with Symphony 5. And it's in needs review. And the last update was nine days ago, so it's cool. still happening. And the other part was Symphony 4 end of life song Jan in January 2020. So right. makes sense. Right. I mean, oh. like, why would they, why would they hold out? So good. Cool. Yes. Yeah. Right. Just going to shift over to five. So now we got our answer. There's logically the only, you know, real proper path, which is five. Um, so nine can have some good legs. Does, does anybody know, does that change any twig compatibility? I'm going to want to read and find out. Yeah. Let me just look. Okay. Yeah. I'm just going to look at it really quickly, but you can keep continuing. I'll, in that comment in a bit. How many people here, and Zoom has a feature that you can use to uh, raise your hand virtually. Uh, uh, how many people here will be migrating from a Drupal 7 site to Drupal 9 or a late version of 7? Yeah, 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 yeah. I no longer have any D7 sites on my plate, so. Um, <laughs> Lucky man. Well, know, lucky in some ways, unlucky in other ways. Now I deal with different uh, hells, but uh, blah, blah, blah. No D7 site to D8 conversion. So that's a good All right. Uh, cool, cool, cool. So now I want to actually uh, kick this over to our first presenter. Uh, Tommy, you ready to? Uh... Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll, sh I'll share my screen. What I'm, I'm just doing a little quick demo of a site my work had us put up uh, in this last week. It, it's basically showcasing how fast it is to do stuff in Drupal. This is still a Drupal 7 site, but, um, but it's worth, worth showing off because it's kind of cool. So my work, I'm working with, I work in the library at Caltech and I work with the archives a lot. And we wanted to start to capture the experience of everybody on campus in this weird time that nobody's really lived through anything like this before. And so that we wanted to set up a site to let people submit anything really about what's happening. Cause basically they shut campus down. All classes this term are online. Um, 
it's really disruptive to everybody. And so as the archives, they want to kind of capture campus life and the life of the community in this time so that people in the future, when they come back and, and study this, they've got some material. Um, we just got it up and I think it was, yeah, less than two weeks ago that the idea even happened. And so what we did was had a bunch of discussions and I, we already had a Drupal seven site up for the archives for some stuff. And I'm like, I can put up a form and collect content very easily if we, if we want to do this. Um, and so I went back and forth with myself. Do I want to do this with a web form or do I want to just make nodes? Um, I actually built it out both ways and gave them prototypes of each. And I kind of just made the decision myself in the end to go with nodes for a couple reasons. One was because the file handling was a little bit different and I think worked a little bit better for me. And it was easier to use views with the content that I got out of nodes. But anyway, the form's very simple. I'll show you what that looks like. And I'm just using a simple um, un unchanged bootstrap theme. Um, we just are we're basically asking for very few things. Their name is optional. Their email is optional. People can submit pretty much anonymously. Um, we do want to know who they are in relation to Caltech. Um, we, we're kind of interested to know like where they got dispersed to because they closed the dorms. Like, a, and we have a lot of international students. And so where did people end up? That's kind of an interesting question. Um, and then we let people fill in pros of whatever they want. Um, we've got a little a couple of writing prompts for people who might not want, not, might not know what to say. Um, and then we let them upload like four files. And so if they upload some, they can do some more Then they have to give us permission to use it. And then the archives has a thing where <clears throat> we know not everybody wants to publish on the web, but we give people an option to publish on the web immediately upon approval. Um, or they can have the archives just keep their, their submission and only make it available to the researchers who come to campus and request it or just make requests for like, let's, let's take a look at the, the pandemic archives or whatever. Or people can say, I don't want anybody looking at this for 25 years because I don't know, some people might write some weird stuff <laughs> or have some personal things that they think, oh, maybe I'll be dead <laughs> or something, I don't know. Um, but anyway, they'll submit it. And then, so when I was designing this, I uh, started to freak myself out a little bit because of this files thing. And I asked a few questions in, in Slack and you all might've seen some of it. Like um, I got worried that I'm letting people upload like all kinds of files, not like executables or anything. I'm, I'm trying to block a lot of that stuff, but documents, we're letting people put up like PDFs and word files when those can contain viruses. So I did end up putting on clam AV on the server and the module for Drupal and it's pretty cool that it just kind of works. If I try to upload a file that has a virus signature in it that that software knows about, it'll just reject it immediately. It won't even let the submission go through. It's very cool. Um, what else was I gonna say? Uh, for what was your question? Test it. Say it again. Test it, did you upload a file with a virus? Yeah, in? well, no, there's a, um, there's a standard thing that, uh, has like a virus signature that triggers everything that you can go download and it's not really malicious. And oh. so you can test antivirus stuff at least to see if it can catch something. And so, I mean, it depends on like, if somebody's got a novel, a novel virus that they, <laughs> that they've just created, the definitions won't be there. I mean, that's always that kind of game with an antivirus, but it's, what's it called? I, I car E I. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. -E so, yeah. That's the one Like it's an organization in Europe that, they have a file that you can put in and it will go and uh, trigger antivirus stuff. And that's what I was testing with. I, I, can, I can probably find one, show you right now what's gonna happen. I've got my iCar file in here somewhere. Yeah, because for a lot of the stuff, there's a global registry for these signatures. Yeah, here we go. So that's why you can have a uh, just a sample file that yeah. is uploaded to these registries for people to test out this kind of stuff. Yeah, so this file has a virus signature in it. And so ClamAV is running on this VM 
and it says the specified file blah blah, blah could not be uploaded a virus has been detected in the file the file will not be accepted and so there's a little daemon running on the server that's just that the drupal module hooks into you give the path of the of the daemon socket or whatever it is and it just is working on anything that gets uploaded it's it's it was way simpler than i thought it would be to put an antivirus thing in linux on a server and make it work with Drupal. So that is something I learned out of this process that was really cool. Um, yeah, and then when people submit, let me get in, where's my admin screen? Let's By the way, over. that Clam AV is already pre-installed on Pantheon sites. Right, available. right, I learned that too. I'm like, oh, it'd be nice if we we're on Pantheon, <laughs> but we're not. So, okay, this is my admin thing that I made for our archives administrators. Uh, simple little view just to, for them to go and improve stuff. Um, I made some approval. I think I made them with flags. Oh, it's slow right now. Sorry. Um, and so when somebody submits, it'll send out an email with rules to a couple of the staff. And um, then they can come over here and look at the node that gets, oh, come on. Oh, yeah. My VM doesn't work very well when Zoom is on. It, everything slows down. Yeah, that's if you're using Docker or any virtualization. Yeah. I don't know what it is. Zoom is just terribly slow. It just kills it. So yeah. well, do I have this open? Maybe if I use the site that is not local, I can show you. Show you the real one. Do I have it open over here? Zoom windows don't seem to get out of my way. All right, so basically my whole computer is just like terribly slow right now. I would st I would stop sharing right now. Let it catch up. And then I've got it. Share. I've got it over here on the. This is a live site, so there's some. I published an example. Whoops. <laughs> I need to stop doing that. Um, anyway, so yeah, say somebody goes in and they see uh, there's a pending review thing. They can click on it. Nobody. I set it up so no users unless they're savvy can get to this node view. And so it doesn't, it's not styled at all, but um, there's an approve and a reject flag. And I put a field on there because the archivists wanted to be able to say like, why did we reject this? And like, so I'll keep a little note with the flag on it. Um, and then once it gets approved, if the person says they may publish it on the web, then it'll actually get picked up by the view and people can see the submission. Um, And so, yeah, here, so we can go in and, and do one of these reviews if it loads. I think it's fast after the first one, yeah. So, and you guys get to see some, some baby pictures here now. So, approve it. I'm not gonna put a note, but then, so this is all what the, I built for the, the managers of this. And I think, I think they're pretty happy with it at the moment. So this one I think was allowed to be published and then we can go and look at the collection and we'll see some stuff that got published and it's it turns out pretty nice when, when we get a bunch in here so we have a little bit of submissions um and then if people do more than one photo like when i did my submission earlier today i put in more than one photo and so if you go into the full thing you can see i had a baby during covid19 and i was able to go back to campus and rescue my plant from my <laughs> desk awesome. because otherwise nice. it would have died <laughs> And so, yeah, people can make little submissions like this. I, I wanted it to be quick and easy. I think we're hoping to just capture a lot of stuff once we do a, a real launch of this thing. We've only soft launched it and announced it to library staff at the moment, but it should be cool. I think I've that is cool. told myself that it's not going to be used maliciously by a lot of people. So, but I'm monitoring it all day, so it, it won't be too bad. And, and it, I just, I really appreciated Drupal in doing this because I knew how to do it. And it was just a matter of getting people to tell me what they wanted for it to happen. So. Um, Pantheon is giving a uh, free three months of uh, the top level host of elite plans for COVID sites like this. Oh, cool. Um, because right now, like, yeah, uh, like, you know, everybody to be able to access stuff uh, is critical. Um, and so there was an initiative to roll that out 
And there's actually a lot of places doing stuff like this. We, we've cited a few of them that inspired our thing, but yeah, a lot of places are starting That's to awesome. put this stuff up. That's so really, really there's cool. some, there's some neat stuff out there. Very cool. Yeah, I was gonna just quickly point out, I've done a lot of work with Clam AV. Um, where you might potentially run into some bottlenecks is if let's say you get any serious level of traffic or if somebody yeah. decides to hammer the piss out of that form. Yeah. Um, that, uh, that, that AV daemon can eat up quite a bit of resources. Yeah, um, no, I already realized that on my VM, I had to bump up the RAM on the VM. I'm like, uh, so we'll, yeah. I, it's something to keep an eye on. So I, yeah. I'm, I'm, there, yeah, the other way you can do that is you just take the submission and then you have a queue that processes it yeah. kind of a thing. Yeah. Like that's, it, that's the way you, if it ends up being gnarly, then that's the yeah. way you go at it kind of yeah. thing, right? But uh, yeah, uh, there's a lot of things on this, on this project where I'll cross that bridge when I get to it or when it comes up because we wanted to get it up quickly yeah. and deal with the problems mm -hmm. as they arise. Uh, awesome. All right. So are yeah. they gonna, have they approved this? Are they going to yeah, go no, live we, with it? Yeah, no, we, we soft launched it to the library staff today. And so nice. we're going to get it in all the campus email newsletters next Monday. And so it'll go out. Nice. That's awesome. And a great little case study there for how to build something super quick with Drupal. That's, yeah. 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 That's great. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. yeah, you got it. Very responsive to, you know, immediate needs. Yeah, timely. I, I, when, when you were doing the presentation, when you said the thing about uh, people being able to uh, choose to not have it published for 25 years or whatever, um, it made me think of like a, like kind of consciously time capsuling their, their content. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. I mean, and I don't think people who, most people don't think about the archives in terms of them getting stuff. They only think about it when they want to go see stuff. But I this agree. is this is kind of exposing the archives to people in a different way. Like, oh, I can actually be a contributor to this for the future, which is pretty neat, I think. Yes, very neat. So thank you for committing to update this site for the next 25 years. Well, that's the that's the other part of this collection. Like this, there, these things are not gonna, this content is not gonna live in nodes on this site forever. So now that it's launched, I have to come up with a plan to extract the data to like, actually preserve it and, and do it in an archival process for, Which is built for in keeping Google. it. Views export. Yeah, we could. Really yeah, good. that's I'm going to build a view and get it out in the CSV. That's all we need yeah. and get the and files. Use and use HTTrack all day for the next 25 years no. <laughs> to create your flat site. No, and that's and but that's the other thing too. It's like the the display of this is just a simple view, and. It, it's not meant to be a permanent site. It's just a simple splash of like, catch. this is what exists right now, but we're going to suck all the content out and like do real digital preservation on it. Ashok, and, you and make it sound like it's uh, doing a mixtape, but on an eight track. <laughs> so, like, you have to have to listen to it all, all the way through. I don't know. I'm just imagining some drush script running day after day, doing nothing for the next 25 years. And then bam, after, after it happens, like what the fuck just happened? Where did this queue just fill up from? That's kind of thing happening for a, so, uh, for a script that's called fulfillment. Yeah, I, I'd call it the Wally script. There you go, Wally. Wally. <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't the 2038 time bug blow it up first? It might. So, but we'll see if I'm, I'm still in this industry. Le legacy data, uh, every, everything yeah. before 38. Let's say I think most of us on this call are old enough to where we should be retired by then. Yeah. <laughs> or that's a good excuse too. Uh, our, our, our Drupal experience will be the new COBOL then. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what I was thinking about. Right topical. <laughs> that was good. Right on, Tommy. Yep. Yeah. That's just like teaching the staff how to do uh, HTML email templates. <laughs> what do we do to ourselves? Mm -hmm. I, um, I, seem to, I seem to be the one that knows how to do it because I write old man HTML. <laughs> I, I, th I, I think it comes down to like, do you use like the emphasis tag or the I tag? You know, like, you know, how old are you? You know, oh, there you go. Right. I remember remembering that debate from Drupal Con a few years ago between Tommy and Mike Stewart. That's who it was between. <laughs> it's always, anyways, Mike. Blah, blah, blah. I don't even remember that. That's funny. That's hilarious. Must have been funny. 
All right, let's get into the next topic. Uh, we're doing pretty good on time here. I, it will be a show. He's going to cover some view. All right, cool. Uh, I guess let me see how to switch. It sounded a little bit like a like a stripper announcer, and now we're going to move over to a show. Nee, nee, nee. Okay. Uh, does does that come with glitter? Uh, is that a framework, a JavaScript framework? It probably is. Let's see, hide video panels. Oh, leave. Ah, the floating meeting controls. Oh, you found it. I was like hating yeah. that thing. Yeah. Yeah, so now we're, well, the topic that Tommy talked about from, you know, putting it into archiving it into something else, even though this is not totally related, is I want to just talk about CMS workflows with Gritsum. And you all know me and you know nowadays I work in Python, but I just wanted to bring up the fact that you know working in Drupal, if anyone looked at the Stack Overflow survey from this year, it's the least loved, least wanted, and the most dreaded uh, web framework out there. And so that's why people are looking for excuses to put stuff in Drupal into other things. So you know it has its good points as well, like Tommy showed where you know you want to set up a site and you know do something good in the world, you, Drupal is a really good choice for that kind of stuff. And uh, moving off of that, um, what is Jamstack? And so there's a bit of a history lesson going here with this stuff. And part of it just has to do with the fact that, you know, I, I've been lo around long enough that I worked for a company that used to build static sites. And they just kind of, it's, it's sucky to work on them it's time consuming, mainly because you're writing the HTML for each page. You're basically copying and pasting the header, the footer, whatever sidebars, all of that crap that used to be there on each of those pages as well. Nothing was dynamic. And then we started to get sites that were built using either a traditional CMS like Drupal, or they might be built using web frameworks like Rails or Django or whatever new stuff is coming out nowadays. But the problem kind of remains the same. Rendering content is usually slow, or there's some there's some slowness somewhere in the system, and then you have to deal with either caching that data that's in there in the system, or caching the HTML, or rendering, or whatever, and then sometimes you're putting a CDN in front of that stuff, and it ultimately ends up costing you um, potentially a lot of money for that stuff. Uh, the advantage with static sites is that well, you can put them on really cheap hardware, and they will still beat the pants off of a off of a um, uh, you know a dynamic site just because of the nature of the problem and so you know when we think about what is out there we started with stuff like HD track or just web crawlers that would crawl the site and then you have something that's flat that's generated there's nothing dynamic about it again but it it can mostly just work and then in 2008 that's when we started to get static site generators uh, like Jekyll and that's where you could have like markdown files or maybe some interaction with a database to be able to generate a site from, from whatever into, into flat HTML. And those were great, but people wanted to be able to start using more modern frameworks with that stuff. And so that's where we start getting into this thing called Jamstack, where for React, people that use React, there's Gatsby. And for people that use Vue.js, there's Gritsum. So, Jamstack is basically um, JavaScript, and that's what's helping power a lot of the, uh, the stuff that people see. So instead of you rendering out using a traditional template in something like PHP with Twig or, or um, handlebars or whatever, you're just going to put it into um, React template files or into a Vue.js file for that stuff. And what you're going to do is you're going to use APIs from wherever your content is to, to basically help generate all of that, all of the flat HTML files for that stuff. And that's where it's using markup to, to kind of pre-build the content. And the advantage with that stuff is that, again, since it's, its end goal is to build out a static site, serving static assets are fast. You could put it in a CDN or you could even put it on something like GitHub or GitLab pages free hosting and it's going to be super fast. 
um, it's also going to be very secure because you're not really going to have to worry about server or database vulnerabilities. It's a flat file. If someone hacks the server it's on, you're just losing that HTML. Um, but the other part with this is also you can use it to preload your app. So you could have something that generates the static site and an initial version of the static site when people first come to it, they get the site within, you know, um, 500 milliseconds or whatever it is. And then you can start putting in dynamic content depending on, you know, whether they are logged in user or whether they have typed something into search for products or whether you, if you know their history. But the main idea is you bootstrap the site it's showing something to the user so they get interested in what they're in the website, what they're looking at, and then you can do something more with it if you choose. So those are some of the things that, that make uh, Jamstack really appealing. And that's, that's why we have so many talks on Drupal and Gatsby going on these days. And ultimately it also just comes down to, arguably it comes down to a better dev experience. Because at the end of the day, then you're just treating Drupal as this endpoint for getting all of the data that it needs for this thing. And then you have people that work in the front end day in and day out working uh, using a framework that they like to use. Like I said, with Vue.js, so it's like they're not really worrying about, oh, I need to make a Drupal template in a specific way and I need to know the fields and all of this other stuff that's internal to it using its it's variant of stuff. And then maybe I need to do pre-processing and all that stuff. It's all kind of thrown out the window and it's like, okay, just do a JSON call and, and work with that. And so this comes into my use case, which is I had a blog. It used to be Drupal seven and then I decided to upgrade it to Drupal eight and it has some level of server side rendering and caching, but I really wasn't interested in trying to theme a Drupal site. And it, it just became a, I want to see where this thing can go with uh, regarding Jamstack. And I'd heard about Gatsby. I wasn't totally in on React. And a friend suggested to me, take a look at Vue.js. And that's where I found that there's a, um, there's a, a Jamstack variant called Gritsum. And it works exactly in the same way that Gatsby would which is where it uses a source. So it could be like Drupal or Markdown or WordPress or even like straight up database calls. And what it does is, and how all of these work is that they will make the initial call to basically get the content of whatever it is that you're looking for from the source. It's going to create a temporary database using GraphQL um, behind the scenes. And in this case, I think it uses something called KeyJS. That's what I ended up finding out. And then, after that data is loaded in there, it uses that to generate your pages using Vue in this case, or if you're using Gatsby, then it would be using React. Um, and then finally, you can use that to deploy that version of your content to using Netlify or to a CDN or to just to your own server or GitLab or wherever for that stuff. And so my plan was, I'm gonna use Drupal as the source for it since I'm used to it. And I really don't want to be making markdown pages and all that stuff because honestly, content editing in Drupal is perfectly fine. Um, I'm going to move it to a password protected domain. So then that way, you know, it can be on Drupal 8.1 for all I care. Um, or, or I think it's in 8.7 or something like that right now. Uh, I'm going to expose the JSON endpoints for it. And then I'm going to let Gritsum and its Graph, GraphQL plugin consume all the data. And then I'll use Vue.js to to generate the pages that I have. And effectively, I'm replacing my um, production version of the website for that stuff. And so let me just change my screen over. So oh, one sec, ah, these controls are back again. So if I take it out, so this is my, the D8 version of the website that I have. And it is, you know, just using Bardic. It has sidebars that I don't care about in there. It has repeating links that I just didn't care to fix or any of that stuff with this thing. Um, and, and yeah, like I said, I wasn't really interested in theming that out. But so what I did, like I said, is converted it over into Gritsum. And so the code base that I have for this stuff uh, is at flash.com slash vtmash. And I'll share it in Slack and 
wherever else as well. Um, and so yeah, the code base is up for the for the stuff for other people that want to use it too. Um, so there there are a few different components to this whole thing. Uh, let me see what my slide said. Right. So we first need to get the content from Drupal. So in the case of Gritson, there's already a plugin for for Drupal for the stuff. So you can automatically just start using Drupal with this. And um, it'll create the GraphQL stuff behind the scenes on here. And in this case, someone put it with, um, or sorry, the plugin automatically works with a demo site that's up there for, for this stuff as well. So you can test it out immediately. And so in my case, let's see, we have the gridsome config file and I, I'm sorry if I sound a little bit disjointed on some of this stuff, but basically what it's doing is that um, I have my site name. It has some configuration related stuff in here. So it has the site name. It's going to have the site description and then it has the plugin and its configuration for this stuff. So first it has like, we know that this is going to be coming from Drupal. Um, I provided the base URL and that's an environment variable. Same with the, the base URL for the, for the base. So for JSON API stuff, it'll look something like And so then Drupal base URL would just be https colon slash slash example.com. And then API base will be JSON API. And then in my case, since I'm using basic auth, it's protected behind the basic auth username and password. And then finally here, we have a few different things. So what it's doing here is it's using templates for rendering out article pages, uh, for rendering out taxonomy term tags. And I'm trying to remember what the other, there's something that I had direct node link for. And I don't remember that. But anyways, article is there and, all right, direct node link was just for me to have like a, like the traditional node slash whatever the node ID is for this stuff. And whereas the path in here is like a, a slug that I'm gonna have for each, um, each node that's there. So like this technically doesn't even require path auto at this point. So you could just have your own slug or you could even just say something like path auto if you wanted it to follow the same kind of pattern that's up on, um, on your own Drupal site for this stuff. And then finally there's an exclude section. And the reason this exists is because when you start looking at what JSON API throws out it's a lot of material. So like um, Gridsome and Gatsby will both try to see what it can do with, or it'll try to get all the content from all of this stuff. So like it'll try to get all the blocks, all the comments, all the contact, all fill outs of all the contact forms or editors and fields and um, modules even and all that stuff. And it's just a whole bunch of extra information that you don't really care for. And so in this case, it's kind of just trimmed down to get the articles, or sorry, get all the nodes, uh, get all the files, and get all the tags, because that's all I care about for this thing. And then in the gridsum, and then there's a gridsum.server.js file. And in here, you basically uh, say what you want the different types of nodes to do. So in my case, I wanted to get the node, and then I'm going to add some additional data for that content to be stuffed into GraphQL afterwards. So in this case, it's like if it's dealing with a file, it's going to, um, it's going to add it to a specific type of GraphQL object called Drupal source, I believe. And it's going to let it know that it's dealing with a file and then it's going to download it and stuff like that. And then it's going to end up in the static directory. If it's dealing with an article, then it knows that the path for this content is going to be slash article slash date path dot title path. Um, and, and again, that's where you get into the, um, you can make it as custom as you want for that stuff. And then it has some highlighting. And then if it's dealing with a tag, then the path word is going to be slash tag slash whatever the um, taxonomy term is in a slugged out approach. And so then from that point, we, start, we can start looking at what these template files can actually even look like. 
So, or actually I'll start with the pages part. So just a flat page, uh, sorry, I'm jumping around again. Uh, so we have different things that go into these grids and sites. So first you have something called layouts and layout is basically just your base template for what your page is going to look like. So in this case, it's going to have, in this case, I have a bunch of divs with um, where the content is going to be. A slot is where your internal page or other templates are going to fit into that thing. And then um, in here we have our like, what all am I importing as part of this, this page. So it's going to have like the nav bar, it's going to have a header, it's going to have a footer. And all of that stuff goes into like, this is where the nav bar is, this is where the footer is, or, or sorry, this is where the header is, and this is where the footer is. So that's how it's able to link all of this stuff up together. And, and then finally, I have some styling that goes into this section as well. And that's how Vue.js works, by the way. It's all in one file. So you have your template section, a script section like this, a, and a style section. So it's all very much just contained. And so here, like we have import nav bar from components slash nav bar of view. And components are basically just like pieces that are going to go into a page. They're not necessarily dynamic, though they can be. Um, but uh, yeah, so like in this case, like I have my footer, or, or sorry, my header again. And again, I have my template for a hero section. This is where I have my site name. This is where, I, and the site description. Um, it's doing a static query for getting the site name and the site description of the site. So that way this can be generic for, you know, if someone wanted to use my version of this for themselves, they could just stub it in with um, COVID-19 and articles or um, notes from people as a description. And it would just, it would be able to fill that stuff in. And again, it has a style in here for how this stuff is going to use, uh, going to look. And then similarly with a nav bar, which has links for certain things and then pagination for um, having a uh, next and previous for like um, a blog listing stuff. So we have our components for that. We have layouts and then our pages are basically like um, what the different endpoints are going to be that people can visit on the site as an initial thing. So like they can go to slash about, they can go to, you know, without the, with just the domain, it's going to go to index and that's where it's just going to list out what this page is about. And finally, what we have is because we're sucking in content, um, we have templates for the different pieces. So like a Drupal node article is going to have a, um, it is going to have a lot more material. So this is where we start going, getting into, it has a template, it has the script, it has the style, but this thing also has a GraphQL query that goes with it. So what this is going to do is it's going to query the article table, for lack of a better word. And from that article, it's going to get the title, the date, the date path, the body, uh, the content, the tags, and the image. And the nice thing about GraphQL is that you can ask for as much or as little as you want. So like, for example, I have here a Drupal node article teaser. And in this case, let me see. This one doesn't have one, but let me see if I can find it for the taxonomy term. Right, so for the taxonomy term, I'm getting back the title, the path, and, and then I'm also getting back information about nodes from here. So, and in this case, I'm only getting back the title, the path, and a little bit of the body. So like I'm not, I, because when I'm on a taxonomy term page, I don't necessarily want it to show the associated files or, or um, various other pieces of information to go with it. And similarly, if we look in my index.view, um, this has, this is the index page and then it has a paginated query to go with it. And this is showing nodes that have their ID, the title, the path, the date and the body. So again, no files that go with it, unlike on the Drupal node um, article view, which has more content, which has additional things to go in there with it. 
And so then when we start working with this thing, let me show that file to the, the package.json file. Uh, here it is. So there's a build, which is gonna build the production release of the code. There's develop, which is basically just the, um, the version that you have locally. It's still gonna suck in content from wherever it is you're pointing this, but you, it's working with like uh, um, all of the stuff that you would have like for, like the watchers for when you change your code and stuff like that, all running in there as part of it. And additionally, if we go to this part here, it lets you see what the GraphQL data is as well. And I haven't played around with this thing in a while, but what we can do is we can start seeing what the schema is for all this content. Ah, come on. ah, here we go. This is a little bit better, but this is where we can see like it's pulled in the Drupal menu, it's pulled in Drupal user, uh, it's pulled in the different node types, um, but then it also has like direct access to a node page or to a node article. And then as we start clicking through this, we can see all of the different pieces of data that are available to us. So like the ID, the title, and so on and so forth. And that's where you can start writing your query here. And I'm just gonna steal what's in the index for this thing. Hopefully it'll work. Can never tell with a live demo. And we can do. You might be missing one curly brace, might. I think so. Try to see which one is. After that one. Yeah, all right. So if we look at what's here, so this is the full query and we can see that it's returning back all of this stuff at it said it would in here, but we could change this up. So let's say we take out path from here and we run the same query again. So now we can see the path, the path is, is now taken out. So it's just not even gonna be available to the view template at that point for, for doing anything with it and or you can add it in and it's available again. And that's definitely a big power or that's one of the big things that's really appealing to people that work with the front end right now. The fact that they can just make this query for the stuff that they need and, and they have access to it. So um, this is probably one of the big things that ended up selling me on GraphQL. It's not good for every use case, but it, it, this is definitely a nice, nice, um, plus one for this stuff. And so anyways, as, we, as it's running, we can also see what it starts to look like. So we can go to localhost 8080 and, and there we go. So this is the new version, this is the version of the site that I have for all of this. And then we can, like I said, we can change up how it looks and everything too. So if we go back to leave default view, we could make, just trying to think of what. There we go. Wow. And um, so like I said, it has the watcher and all that stuff running. All the content is already in place. So it's automatically able to start um, changing it up uh, with that stuff. And since it's all at this point, it's not yet flat HTML, but it has access to it in a pretty speedy way. So that's why the site can feel relatively fast and everything as well. And finally, then when you're happy with it, then you can do something like npm run build, which will make the static version of the site as well. So it's gonna go through everything. And then when we come in here, I believe, yeah. So it ends up creating a distribution directory, I think. We'll see what happens. These errors don't pop up on my main machine. It's the, I put this on the new laptop, so it's acting funky, but I mean, it still, still works, so that's a good thing. No, that sucks. 
but it still built out the site. So, so if we look in here inside the distribution directory, mm -hmm. we can probably see the index.html that has all of the content that's going to go in here. And then similarly with, if we look inside the article, we can see all of the stuff that's been built out over the years and, and, and the content to go for that. So in this case, yeah. So that's, that's how it builds out all this stuff. And finally, the part that, that made me most excited with all this stuff is once I have my site or once I have everything, I want to be able to deploy my Drupal, the Drupal content that's there effectively to the production site. So because like right now, if we look here, you can see that I have this new node, LA Drupal meetup tonight on Zoom, and it has some content and all that stuff. Whereas if we go to the main site, it does not have that content yet. And, and so what I did with all of this is I, because I was using GitLab, um, I actually integrated this into a GitLab workflow. So what I do with this thing is it, aside from getting all the, all of the setup part that's here, uh, the big things that are running is that since it has all of, it has my secrets for the domain and all of that stuff, it just does an NPM install and NPM run build. So it creates that um, that version of the content locally uh, or within the Docker or within GitLab's infrastructure. And then it just SSHs and R syncs all of that content onto the server afterwards. But the nice thing about GitLab is that it also has webhooks to trigger these, um, these triggers. So if we go into pipelines, once you write something out, aside from you, you know, I did not want to log into GitLab to say, okay, now publish the content. You can say, you can basically have a hook in your Drupal site that says, okay, if I want to, you know, just ping this URL. And when it does that, it will automatically start running the pipeline for deploying all this stuff out into production. So let me show that. So like I'm in my, there we go. There's the Drupal site. And I'll show the code for the, the plugin that's there for this thing too. But basically what it does is, in my case, I put in the content section. There's a publish to GitLab link. And there's the trigger URL for where it's gonna hit GitLab. And once I do this, let's see what, hopefully it works. All right, so now it's sent the request to GitLab. And if we come in here, we can see that it's started it. It's starting to do that whole process for deploying the stuff to production. So it's gonna pull down the Docker image. And in this case, it's using node 10. My local machine had node 13 and that's what was causing the issues. But yeah, it just takes a couple of minutes uh, to go through this thing. I don't know if, uh, if there's any point in seeing any secret keys or any of that stuff. I mean, whatever, I'll just change it up if I need to, but I have all this content locally too. So it's not, not a huge deal. Oh, sure. You um, saw I made a comment about it. Pardon? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, but yeah, there's nothing, I mean, the most sensitive stuff, with this thing is, so I have a .env file and that's where I have my secrets for the stuff locally, like for the base URL yeah, and API yeah, base. Yeah, don't worry about and then similarly, like if I go to GitLab, um, let me remember where this stuff is. It's been a while. It's, it's, it's pretty much on autopilot at this point, which is nice. Um, if I go to the CICD settings, this is where if I expand this out, you can see what that I have my different variables for the stuff. And in this case, it's already blurred out because like if I go to edit it, then it'll start showing all that information for me. So not, nothing to worry about on this front. And, and yeah, even in the pipeline, when you start looking at it, it will blur out any secrets that you have. So 
And I think it does that up here somewhere. Where is it? Or it'll do it somewhere for this thing. Uh, it's still building out everything. Uh, this is taking more or longer than I expected. Um, but that's, uh, that's a live demo. And uh, let's see. Yeah, are there any questions in the meantime? Um, where are the limitations? Like if, if you had, let's say, multiple editors using this at once, would you be running into like conflicts because you'd be running, kicking off multiple builds and... It totally ends up depending on the kind of publishing schedule that you want for this stuff. So potentially like if, ever, if everything needs to go live immediately, then yes, there could potentially be issues with some of this stuff. And, but that's where I also mentioned the idea that you could use this to bootstrap a site, an initial version of the site that has all of your, you know, the static variant of your content. So at least people see your landing page and it's not stuck in the, the rendering portion of things. And then you could have it start to make your actual API calls for, for filling in por portions of the site that you wanted to. Or additionally, like um, a company that I worked at before, uh, a long time ago was one where you know, content changes were done in a day. And then at the end of the day, they published all of that stuff out. Like once someone looked at it, reviewed that things look good, then they would publish it afterwards. And you could have a workflow that's, that's kind of like that too. So uh, there, there are different ways to approach this kind of thing. Um, yeah, I don't know if that really answered your question though. No, I'm, yeah, I'm just, I'm thinking of, yeah, like, uh you know, editorial situations where you might have multiple editors at once. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, if, if a build takes, you know, let's say just for sake of numbers time, five minutes and somebody, you know, posts a, an article every two minutes, yep. you know, run into like race to compete, that kind of thing. Um, yes so, and no. Okay. So what'll end up happening is that you'll have a whole bunch of uh, builds queued up and then it'll just kind of be going at that, at that stage. But um right. But yeah, like since it's going off of whatever is the latest content, um, the, the newest version of the site would be up sooner in that case. Uh, the other thing is that you could just limit the number of people that have access to, to publish it to live, to publish to production. So then like as, as changes are being done, then you could, then, you know, someone could queue it up behind the scenes and then it's like, okay, now I'm gonna push everything to production. Kind of a thing. So it's all about how you want to um, stage out the workflows at that point. It, it opens up interesting things for people, I find. And um, yeah, that's all oh, right. I was going to show version here with, with Zoom. There we go. And it loaded up right away. So you can see it's up. Meetup is night it's on Zoom. Oh shit. Did I break something? Probably. This was, this was a personal side of show. So like what I'm thinking is one of the things people, you know, I think forget is, oh, hey, I could decouple. Uh, I can do, you know, this uh, kind of static output, uh, you know, to my Drupal site. But then it's also, you know, it's something that they forget if there's other people that depend on being able to access and edit content. You got a lot of fields. You got, a, you know, if you got a lot of stuff that it has to pull in uh, mm -hmm. for these editors, you know, you can't uh, forget to, uh, you know, take care of the back end CMS, even if this is output in the front end there. And uh, that's one of the things that I've noticed, uh, you know, some people kind of, <clears throat> uh, you know, they don't think about, uh, a tr you know, they kind of, what is it? Uh, they powered down, uh, you know, the, some oh, yeah. of the Drupal, right? Like, oh, I don't, I don't need the full, you know, capability. And it was like, well, especially if you're, you know, uh, seven plus editors and all this field itis that we might have, you know, all these integrations that you got. Uh, but yeah, the end result, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's definitely one of the kind of the uh, leanest kind of opportunities, uh, you know, for uh, uh, modern CMS in terms of a front end. Well, not lean, but, you know, a quick, you know, um, pretty, pretty fresh there. That was cool. I like, right. how, I like how simple your theme is though. I, I do like that. But, oh, thanks. Um, I had a slide in here about uh, somewhere in one of these. 
pull it up. Of course, like, uh, what did I say in here? Yeah, so we looked at displaying the content. Uh, I'm still not confident in my view capabilities, but at the same time, it all seemed to work out well, so I'm, I'm happy with it. And then talked about deploying. Uh, there were pain points that I had run into, which have since been solved in Gritsum. And part of it was Drupal defines a path object, and um, especially if you're using path auto. So I had to do some additional stuff in the gridsum.server.js file that you actually don't need to do anymore for that stuff. And additionally, because my site was being upgraded from D7 to D8, that's where it just does some funky stuff, where if you're starting off with a Drupal 8 site, it just works out of the box for that stuff. And yeah, what I really like, like I said already, the site is super fast. It's on, I think I pay either two and, I mean, either paying two and a half bucks a month or five bucks a month for the server. And it's, it's just super fast on that thing. And again, like there's nothing for people to really hack into on there. And I think with, yeah, I, I, I take your point on, you know, if you have like the field itis related stuff, I think there are ways, I mean, so long as whoever's helping maintain the site is involved in it, I think they can do some stuff, especially if theming related stuff was involved anyways. There's, um, there's room there for, you know, just telling them, hey, there's this new field we wanna pull in. And literally it's adding one new line to GraphQL and, and then whatever number of lines for the additional field that are gonna be going up. So the changes would be, really, really small, this stuff. And then with large sites, then you could start getting into or into doing actual API call territory and stuff like that and, and do something interesting. And for me, I was interested in potentially publishing this stuff out into Netlify and Netlify seems to have a CMS. And I'm very curious about things that could potentially be done between Drupal and, and Vue. And I think Jesus is trying some stuff with Gatsby and Drupal in the same kind of, in, in basically making a Drupal variant of Netlify using Gatsby and React. And I'm thinking of the same thing, but with Gridsome and Vue. So I don't know, there, I, I see some interesting things coming out of all of this, this kind of stuff. And- um, I was just gonna say, the word is on the street, the Pantheon's working on a static site generator. I would not be surprised. This meet us brought to you by Pantheon as well, by the way. On. They have some fast sites. <laughs> fast, um, site, fast sites, move on. Um, but anyways, the, the last point of this was, you know, just me thinking about, do I want to use SAS? Because technically Vue.js supports SAS within the, the Vue templates as well. But, you know, I have new ways to generate all of this stuff, but my sites still look like shit. I don't know. I'm not a back, I'm not a front end person. Mm -hmm. So uh, the views library, are they, are they compiling the SAS to CSS or is it relying on modern browsers being able to render SAS? What, no, what it'll it? compile it from SAS to CSS. It'll okay. make an optimal version of that stuff. Got so it. like if they're repeating rules and stuff, it, it takes care of everything with this thing, with this stuff. It's, it's honestly really, really awesome. But nice. you know, if you're not a front end person, your site might still not look that great. Uh, so yeah, that's it for me for this stuff. Right on. Um, you brought up the Netlify CMS. Uh, some of the uh, kind of uh, popular CMSs with the static site generators that are not Drupal and not WordPress. Um, you know, they, they have these tiers of pricing and features that, you know, one of the easy ones is like just roles, <laughs> like literally user roles is like mm -hmm. a, uh, a higher end paid feature uh, you know, so it's like, uh, you know, you can, uh, the cost can run away from you where, you know, you're like, oh, cool. Like I could do all of this and not, you know, need to kind of have uh, maybe Drupal do everything there. Um, but you're kind of recreating some of those pieces I've seen. And then also, like I said, things we take for granted, like literally like volumes of user accounts and then roles uh, at our discretion. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, uh, that is literally like kind of more professional or even enterprisey kind of pricing tiers uh, right. groups. Uh, and then of course, like, you know, big, big doc sites, you know, like uh, Pantheon outputs to Gatsby now the docs pages. So uh, that's one of the ways where we, we not only with a static for 
uh, that, but it was like, that made the most sense. That's not, you know, an interactive area necessarily. It's just consumed in red. Uh, So, you know, making that that experience as fast as possible and, uh, you know, totally makes sense. But, uh, you know, the rest of the site is not that, you know, so. Um, they're, they're, they're appropriate spots. I, what's funny is it, what's old is new again here, right? What, oh, what, yeah. Stop sharing. What, you, what, what were you going to show? Oh, I wasn't going to show anything. I just wanted to stop sharing. Wait, oh, see your faces. Doing, you were doing your shopping with us on? Or you just on the share? Pardon? What were you, what were you, I thought you were showing something about uh, uh, um, like, a, like one of the tools or the features. I, I didn't see what was on. The, I didn't oh, read. no. It was on the Netlify page. Um, oh, okay. I can go back and I can show the Pantheon page instead. Um, <laughs> hey, hey, hey. But, um, but no, I wanted to see your faces Good so, to, Good to be able to talk. Um, yeah, it to- that, yeah, that's why we get into this area of, you know, what can we, because we're all at, we're at the stage of like, someone types in a domain or someone clicks on a link, how fast can it load so they can start seeing stuff, right? And it's like, okay, if we can have something that can generate, a, like, like that's why I said, if they can have something that generates even like they're able to see a site and then, you know, as they're browsing or whatever, then it starts filling in stuff. Like that's a, that's a really powerful way to, to think of your site at this point. I remember the old days where um, this was with checks where he was talking about server side includes and stuff like that for stitching data or stitching HTML uh, in the back end for doing stuff. And it's like, we've come such a long way from there where, you know, we can have components that can kind of fetch all that data for us and, and start filling that data in, you know, in the front. So we can have like areas that are cached and areas that are going to be dynamic. Um, you know, in, ironically in though, I feel, like, I feel like this is like, this just feels like the single page PHP sites that we used to build 15 years ago, 16 years ago, where Mm -hmm. you have all of your, you know, you've got one page and you say, here's all the variables for this page. You might do an include from some other file that stores all your globals. Mm -hmm. And then you basically frame everything up and then you lazy load it in with variables. And, you know, even then we were using JavaScript to lazy load, uh, you know, heavier things onto the page. That's just, it's, uh, it's an interesting it's an interesting path. I mean, I, I see the benefit of it, um, but I think at the in my this is my personal opinion. I think at the end of the day, the the reason we're doing all this stuff is because we feel like we can't make PHP CMS is fast enough. Um, and I, you know, the simple argument to that is is just put a CDN in front of it, pay twenty bucks, and you've got a blazingly fast site. You get all the benefits of having a really robust CMS. So I, I'm yes and no. I've been, yeah. But I mean, it, I, I've, yeah, I've just seen a lot of, the, I've seen all this work and I feel like, okay, at the end of the day, it's now we have to manage another set of technologies just to oh, get yeah. this one benefit add and change control is now, you know, potentially a multi-step process. Now, obviously if your pipeline is really robust and built out and it's automated and everything works great until it doesn't. And then let's say, key subject matter expert isn't at the company anymore Mm -hmm. it it become it just becomes it's a it's a a bigger bigger potential for technical debt down the line so um you know i'm I'm still trying to find a use case that works for me for chopping drupal's head off and i haven't found one yet it totally depends yeah it totally depends on what your your end goal is with this stuff i just i didn't want to do another drupal template and I was like, I want to learn some Vue and let's just see how I can make learning. Yeah, that's, that's and let's see how we can make learning Vue interesting. It's like, oh, it right. integrates with Drupal in this tangential way. So, uh, There's so that makes it. I want to share that comes to mind in the show here, like literally, which is uh, um, one, uh, what's old is new again, right? Like yep. you know, just, you know, this kind of architecture, right? But also two. Uh, there, the second one is the uh, the ebb and flow of responsibility. It's the tug of war. Of res- it's not even a tug yeah. of war. It's a shift, right? Like you have client server and it's never always 50-50. You know, it's always going literally back and forth between them, you know, sometimes 80-20 mm-hmm. nowadays. Um, you know, but so uh, it, it, it's very, it's fun and interesting, but I, I literally am just, I'm, my bones are just, you know, they're, they're, they're recalling a lot of things that literally uh, 10 years ago we were doing and then even, uh, you know, a little bit prior to that too. Um, just new, new tools, right? Like now it's like there's, I would say, uh, 
easy expect or more expectations for things to be a little bit easier like the data explorer like we we didn't have we didn't, that wasn't not an like an expectation to have in the tool set uh that comes with a framework like we would have it in our tool set you know mm -hmm. like uh soap ui right or you know and write rules and you know all this other stuff and uh that that has i think really not only enabled people but um you know they kind of I uh, really get stuck on these uh, on these new pieces because I think it's almost like um, trinkets, right? For for some degree, and they're very helpful. But it's also like, look how easy this was. But then it's like, yeah, but you're also forgetting the responsibility. And I think that was Mariano. What you're going to is you're forgetting the responsibility of everything that is going to power that too, right? Like oh, yeah. you're you're agile in this piece, and uh, it, it's always fun to see that. Uh, like I said, the ebb and flow of the shift, uh, you know, between the, what what site is more dominant or more powerful and popular, uh, you know, for, for a period of time. So that, that was fun. And, that was good. And there was a cool yeah, talk I, at uh, scale on you might not need JavaScript. And uh, <laughs> the talk was, so the talk was basically some people are, or this one person basically did a benchmark of loading a, let me remember this now, loading a view or no, sorry, a React app with one piece of content from, from whatever database query or whatever was happening and versus a loading, I think he said 8,000 pieces of content on a flat HTML page. And the flat HTML page with the 8,000 pieces of content was still marginally faster than the view or, or the react page with one piece of that content. And it, it became, it just became like, you know, there are definitely advantages to, you know, looking at front end development for the stuff, but you need to, you need to see why you're doing it. If you're literally just doing it to load one piece of content, you might as well just be using flat HTML for that if, stuff. If, just if because it's such a second, those, those tens of hours that you spend to get that, you know, yes. one page, mm -hmm. Come on. But um, yeah, it's all about that. Oh, you know, how fast can we get the user to see something? So yeah. But anyways, it was fun to try out Gridsome. I had fun. And uh, it's interesting. Thank you for introducing me to that. I'm definitely going to go take a swipe at it. Yeah. Or try Gatsby uh, if you like React. I mean, they're, they're so similar in terms, right. conceptually, they're just so similar. It's like, do you like Vue? Right. For Gridsome, do you like React? Go for Gatsby. Otherwise, sure. they're exactly the same thing. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Right. I had a quick, I had a quick um, little community project that people should be aware of. It's related to front end stuff. I'll share it real quick. Uh, share screen. So, oh yeah, I need to be uh, approved here. Share screen. Oliver's going through some serious metamorphosis over there. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> uh, let's see here. So I think someone needs to, whoever's the host uh, needs to allow me to share Chris Stopper. Uh, I can share my There you go, now you're a co-host too. Cool, and then, yeah, I'll just, I think I can share, yeah, desktop one. So, um, you guys are familiar with Claro, right? Uh, by now, I think I did a demo of that a while back. Okay. Um, Drupal these 9. guys, yeah, and yeah, it'll be, it'll be the default uh, admin theme in Drupal 9. Um, you guys can see my screen here, right? This Jin admin theme. Yep. Yep. So Jin is based off of Claro, um, and there's some additional modules that you might want to add. I'll dump those in a second, but it's really nice. It allows you to have a dark theme, which might be a, an ask by your customers. Um, as somebody who was modifying, uh, up until I recently lost my job, <laughs> a Claro theme, uh, a Claro sub theme, uh, I'm, I'm really appreciative of the work that's gone into this theme. We've done a really good job of, of making it look clean. Um, so you'll see a lot of Claro-isms there, but you also see some of the stuff that they've done. They've done a really good job of making it a, a nice dark theme. 
um, they do allow for some some customization for, from a color scheme perspective. So if you want to tweak that a little bit, it's nice, especially if you've got you're really trying to brand something for a customer. Um, but in my opinion, a big update to the admin experience. Um, the module that you'll need for the admin theme is the Gin toolbar. So it gets rid of the, uh, uh, or it, it appends the, the existing toolbar, but um, uh, allows you to kind of customize it, which is really cool. So you can kind of come in and, and brand things um, uh, accordingly. Um, and then uh, this is really nice too. Uh, this is, I feel like this is something I kind of recreate every single time I go and do a Drupal build is kind of recreate the login page. So they've got some nice, kind of login pages to kind of uh, build an experience. So That's if you haven't checked it out. Yeah, yeah it's, it's cool. And it's, uh, it's using the contemporary design pattern. So definitely check it out. Okay. Give, it, give these guys a shout out. Uh, use it if you can. Yeah, right. that's Thanks it. Mm -hmm. Well, hey, John, you ready to go next? As soon as I, <coughs> I unmute, uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Okay. There you go. Can you see that? Yep. Yes. Okay. Uh, so my uh, little presentation is uh, on uh, model ver module versioning in Drupal, as you might guess. Um, I'm me, and I have an email address. Um, some examples of how not to do versioning is to put the year in the version. Uh, and uh, I use PHP Storm. I don't use Windows or at any rate. Uh, other example of how not to do version uh, versioning is um, these Drupal modules. Um, the proper semantic version no, no, versioning uh, is consists of a major, a minor, and a patch. Each, and you probably know all those, they consist of digits and uh, pre-release indicators can be added. Examples, WordPress uh, and Joomla have proper semantic versioning. And yes, Jetpack is a uh, WordPress uh, plugin. Uh, I thought Chris liked that. Um, for the major version, <clears throat> A, a new major, major version would probably have new features. For example, Jetpack's available. Would uh, the, Its uh, main purpose is to introduce breaking changes. The horse and buggy is not being supported. Deprecation is probably not at this point. And bug fixes, uh, a new major version is more for the purpose of introducing new bugs rather than fixing old ones. Uh, the minor version, um, it's uh, mostly new features that do not make breaking changes. So uh, for version 3.1, you might have jetpacks actually fly instead of you just walking around with them. Um, uh, no breaking changes. Uh, you might start to get deprecations here. Um, the hand crank ignition is scheduled for removal and uh, probably bug fixes. The hand crank ignition doesn't fall off. Um, and then the patch version is for um, fixes that don't add features or break chain or have breaking changes. Uh, for example, the jet packs stop exploding. Um, and then there's the pre-release identifiers like those. Uh, the uh, RC uh, one that kind of looks like a Lando uh, uh, um, version. <laughs> uh, yeah. Almost 85. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, improper versioning, like in Drupal, uh, or the Drupal, there's the Drupal API the uh, <clears throat> major version and the patch number uh, applies to uh, contrib modules and themes only. The API is the Drupal version. The patch includes both minor and patch. 
Um, for example, 8x that has new features, namely that it works in Drupal 8, as breaking changes, namely that it doesn't work in Drupal 7. Um, the major it's version. Good mapping. Um, uh, you know, uh, new features, probably breaking changes. The example I have here is that the fields in the URL alias table are renamed for no reason, which they seem to be at one point, although that was in core, not a module. And uh, let's see. We've it's got right before 8.8 um, 8 was released. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> it's right before 8.8 8 was released. It's like 8.79 or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Whatever that was. I mean, come on. Uh, the patch version um, it might have new features. Who knows? We, we don't know whether this is a minor or a patch, really. Breaking changes, we hope not, but this is Drupal. Um, and uh, <clears throat> maybe some deprecations and probably some uh, bug fixes. Okay, so Drupal is planning to get off the island and hopefully not into Davy Jones' locker. <laughs> um, transitioning to semantic major minor patch versions, uh, they will be compatible with Drupal 8.8.3 and later. Um, <clears throat> both semantic and Drupal versioning during the transition and semantic only starts with Drupal 10. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so uh, here's an example that, you know, the, you have the, um, uh, the semantic version and the older Drupal version uh, uh, there. Um, uh, it knows that uh, 8.x 2.5 is older than 3.0.0. Um, and pre relay suffix is, includes a hyphen, uh, one, what is that? Oh, gee. Uh, I may have had organic groups on the mind. Uh, one word that's supposed to be alpha, beta, or RC and a sequential integer. Um, and those are examples. And apparently not uh, the dev thing that people like to use. And why not? Uh, be uh, partly because it's not one of the three magic words and partly because mm -hmm. it has no digit exactly. after it. Yep, correct. Um, and let's see. Okay, here's some resources you can go to. Um, semantic, this is the official semantic versioning site, um, or, you know, the, their information. Um, oh, not that. Uh, this is uh, Drupal's release naming conventions. Uh, pay where they talk about the stuff and um, the oh, 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 I don't want that. Uh, okay, um, and this is um, they put in a uh, test module to um, just to test out the semantic versioning, and there you go. Oh, if the um, uh, uh, Drupal, I mean, semantic version example 2.0 and 2.1 are after um, 1.0. Okay. That stuff and, is really nice. It illustrates it well, I think. Yeah. And uh, let's see. Is there, oh, yes. Yeah, stay healthy. Whoop, whoop. And that's it. Um, I, uh, I also have something that we're doing at Otis, kind of in response to COVID-19, semi in response to COVID-19. I don't know if you want to see that or not. Sure. sure. Okay, so um, every year, Drupal? what's that? Is it building Drupal? Uh, yes, yes, uh, Drupal 7. <laughs> um, every yeah, year- uh, done Drupal. 
What's that? The getter done drupal. Yeah. Um every year uh Otis has a uh you know, it's an art school and they have an annual exhibition for their graduating students. Um, so they can put up a few pieces of work and uh, prospective employers are invited and they get, you know, start to make connections and that's not happening this year. So this year, um, we're having virtual exhibitions. Now this is a test site with uh, uh, test students. Um, here's a, uh, let me close some other tabs here um and let's see did i get a load that hang on here um ah yes i did get a picture in there for me okay so uh toy design is not actually a student it's a department and they sort first um Student example actually has um, one of these virtual exhibitions, and it's you know basically a slideshow of sorts. Um, and the uh, slide descriptions change. It's hard to see because, especially since these are so tall, every time the well the slide change, so well, that's kind of cool. Um, so. Uh, so basically um, the information, the, the displays that they would put up at their, you know, physically at the annual exhibition are now online. And so they don't lose quite as much contact with um, employers. So, um, I don't know, that's it. That's cool. Awesome. Okay, let me stop sharing. There we go. All good stuff, everybody. That was fun.